flank and Benzema's there again. Oh, can you believe this? A top player at the very top of his game. The day before Chelsea faced Real Madrid in the first leg of their recent European clash, Alan Shearer wrote in The Athletic, it goes without saying that Chelsea's main task in their Champions League quarterfinals starting at Stamford Bridge tomorrow is to stop him. But that's easier said than done. With him, of course, being Karim Benzema. <laughs> I think he was right. Because it was on that night that hat-trick hero Benzema came to life. All three of his goals in that first leg were immaculate all for different reasons. His build-up play for the first, his technique in hitting the ball back where it came from for the second, and his tireless pressing for the third. Then, one week later, in the reverse fixture, when Chelsea looked to be on the cusp of a miraculous comeback, he scored the goal that would eventually be the difference in the tie, backing off Antonio Rudiger in the box and guiding the ball out of Mendy's reach with precision. At 34 years old, Karim Benzema is having the best season of his career, a nailed-on Ballon d'Or winner to many. He's always been good, but he's only gotten better and better with age. However, he is no saint and has even been found guilty of criminal charges as recently as 2021. For reasons we'll be getting into in a bit, a fair share of people feel he shouldn't even be allowed on the pitch in the first place. Today's a Benzema episode. The good, the bad, and the downright outrageous. With that being said, how good is Karen Benzema and how did we get here? Yo, what's going on guys, Anti Nash here, hope you're all doing well. If you haven't already, that red button down there could do with some love. I mean, I'd really appreciate it, but no pressure. Karim Benzema has had quite the career over the past decade and a bit, but before we dive into his recent electric form, let's go ahead and start this one off from the very beginning. Born in Lyon in 1987 as one of nine children, Karim Benzema is the son of an Algerian father and a French mother. The neighborhood he grew up in was a little rough but he grew to love football and was lucky enough to have the full support of his family in his endeavors. But he apparently didn't keep the best company with regards to his childhood friends, something that didn't seem to change as he grew older. But more on that in a bit. Before long, Olympique Lyonnais took notice of him as a 10-year-old and seeing as they were the largest club in the city, it was pretty obvious what the outcome of that interest would be. That was in 1997. Fast forward to 2004 and the man had outperformed everyone's expectations and was on course to be introduced to the first team. A strong attacker, brilliant at coming deep to progress the play, a great passing range in advanced midfield areas and, of course, deadly in front of goal. Michael Essien, Florent Moluda, Eric Abidal, Sylvain Wiltord and Hatem Benarfa were just some of the players that were lacing up for Lyon at the time. And when Benzema was being introduced to the team and had to stand up and speak to them in an initiation tradition, I guess he was a bit nervous and they all laughed at him. And his response? Do not laugh, I'm here to take your place. That's pretty icy, I'm not gonna lie. In a way, he wasn't wrong. By 2007, all of the above-mentioned players had left the club and Benzema was all of a sudden the leading man. Something I haven't mentioned is that in 2007, Lyon were just coming off a title-winning season. Their sixth title-winning season in a row. I'm pretty sure someone in the comments has already typed Farmers League by now. Anyway, the pressure was really on for the man. Yes, he had contributed to the previous three wins, but this time, he was more important than he had ever been, and only 20 years old. Continuing the winning streak was never going to be easy. Oh, oh, never mind. Uh, they won their seventh in a row, and Benzema was named the league and player of the year. 31 goals and 10 assists in 52 games, and a top 30 finish in the 2008 Ballon d'Or. Okay, we, we have to give credit where credit is due. These seven wins weren't easy, but the history books and the current football hive mind will probably make it look that way. In any case, Barcelona took notice of this and began investigating further. According to Marca, they were in for Benzema that year and even went as far as sending their sporting director at the time, Chiki Begiristein, over to his house to have a chat. And I wish I was making this up, but apparently one of the main reasons that they chose not to sign him was the fact that Benzema didn't make eye contact with Begiristein during this meeting. Unfortunately for Barca, this was their loss. A year later and Florentino Perez did not have the same reservations in the slightest. The man was heading over to the Bernabeu. As is the case for almost every player that goes over to the Spanish capital, moving to Madrid was the classic case of a big fish in a small pond becoming a small fish in an ocean. Benzema was coming in at a lofty 35 million euros, which would have been an eye-opening acquisition if he didn't come in alongside two Ballon d'Or winners and the Ballon d'Or holder at the time. 
He was going to have to put in some crazy hours if he was going to make this move work. And the fact that Gonzalo Higuain, who was already at the club, was in tremendous form this year, led the scoring for Madrid in La Liga and relegated Benzema to the bench didn't help much. Adding on to that, he was having trouble learning Spanish as quickly as the Madrid faithful would have wanted. He was only 22, but 9 goals and 6 assists and 33 appearances, as well as everything I just mentioned, was not good enough for a Real Madrid striker. Things weren't going great, but what would happen soon after would form a giant grey cloud that would hover over his head for not only the remainder of his football career, but his life. In 2010, Karen Benzema and three other French national team players were under investigation for their alleged involvement as clients in a prostitution ring that was being ran out of a nightclub in Paris. Frank Ribéry, Sidney Govou, Hatem Benarfa, and Benzema himself. Now, prostitution is legal in France, but the escort must be over 18. However, in the case of Benzema, Ribéry, and who knows how many others, the escort in question was not. And before you ask, yes, it was the same girl. 2008 for Benzema, 2009 for Ribéry. Eventually, the case was dropped due to insufficient evidence that the pair knew her actual age, as she went on record saying that she lied about her age on both occasions. Many still have their doubts over whether this was the correct result at the time. Regardless, public record fails to prove that they did anything wrong, and none of us were in the room. And even though they were cleared, Karim Benzema was left out of the national team squad for the 2010 World Cup. French coach at the time, Raymond Dominic, was adamant that this was due to his poor performances at Madrid rather than any alleged shady dealings, which may well have been true. After all, Ribéry and Govou were on the plane to South Africa. And to add further legitimacy to Dominic's decision, the criticism on the pitch following the World Cup just kept pouring in, this time from new Madrid coach Jose Mourinho. Benzema must understand that he is extremely talented, but that in itself is not enough. We need a striker who is sparky, not one that is listless. Ouch. But wait, there's more. On another occasion, he went on to say, If it was just for you, I would make training at midday because you arrived at 10 o'clock half asleep and then by 11, you are already sleeping again. He was lazy. Which is why when Gonzalo Higuain suffered a back injury halfway through the season, Emmanuel Adebayor was brought in on a short-term loan to replace him, even though Benzema was fully fit. Even Kaká, of all people, was critical of Benzema. We have the feeling that Karim could do rather more. Oof. But this little segment has a happy conclusion. He took all of this criticism to heart and began training harder than ever. A significantly improved 26 and 48 that year meant he was on the right track. And he didn't stop there, dropping 8 kilograms in the 2011-12 offseason and returning with a bang to help Madrid to a historic 100-point season. And the next six years pretty much followed suit. More top performances from Benzema, four Champions League titles, and an additional La Liga win to justify Madrid's sizable investments. But what was so impressive about Benzema was his ability to adapt to what was needed from the team over the years. In France, he was the big fish, like I said. It was all about him. In Madrid, it was all about this guy. Benz had to play his part, which meant he had to sacrifice his own glory to a large extent. At a high level, Cristiano Ronaldo, a winger at the time, was always the type of player to drift infield and drive towards the goal, effectively crossing Benzema's running lines. For CR7 to be given license to do so, Benzema had to vacate that space, often by occupying the space Ronaldo left on the flank, or dropping deep into somewhat of a number 10 role. He also frequently had to play with his back to goal and bring the rest of his team into the game during fast transitions. This was his role. This theme of selfless gameplay is something that grew more and more prevalent as Cristiano Ronaldo got up there in age and started spending less time on the flank, as well as when Gareth Bale came into the squad and started occupying central areas himself. Benzema also showed that he was not only a source of goals, but also a dependable playmaker. For example, in the 17-18 season, his least productive year in front of goal for Madrid, he scored 5 goals in 32 appearances in the league, something that led to mass criticism. And rightly so, I mean, he played for Real Madrid and he wore the number 9. No arguments here, he really should have been doing better in front of goal. But what many scoffed over was not only everything I mentioned before that, but also the fact that he created 44 goal scoring chances that year in La Liga alone, an average of about 1.4 per game, he had a passing completion percentage of 83% and also bagged 10 assists. He also scored 5 and assisted 1 in the Champions League, which Real Madrid won for the third year in a row. But as we all know, for a player of that caliber and professionalism to be criticized without context is unfortunately pretty normal. Having said that, there may have been other reasons for why he was getting such hate. 
Reasons outside of anything to do with his form for Madrid, without anything to do with the pitch, as a matter of fact. Let's rewind the clock back to 2015, literally one year after being acquitted from the previous unsavory sex scandal, and he was in hot water again. This is Mathieu Valbuena, a former French international. In mid-2015, a group of unsavory characters got their hands on an explicit recording of Valbuena engaging in sexual acts with a woman. And as unsavory characters tend to do, they attempted to extort a range of things from him, most significantly 150,000 euros. Valbuena was not having it and went straight to the police who began an investigation. When the blackmailers couldn't get through to Valbuena, they enlisted a contact of theirs, Karim Zanati, a man who was previously convicted of armed robbery and drug possession and also happened to be a childhood friend of Karim Benzema's. You guys remember earlier on when I said he grew up around a rough crowd? Zanati is said to have convinced Benzema to get Valbuena to engage with the demands of the exploiters. Little did Benzema know, Zanati was under investigation and had his phone tapped. So after Benzema had spoken with Valbuena and reported back to Zanati on the details of their conversation, the world was now aware of his involvement in the whole affair. He was charged with complicity in a blackmail attempt and after years of deliberation, was found guilty in late 2021, fined 75,000 euros and sentenced to a one-year suspension suspended jail term. These are the facts, and I'm not even going to attempt to speculate on what actually went down. But what I will say is that Karim Benzema has always maintained that he was only just trying to help Valbuena to get rid of the tape. I mean, the man was easily earning over 150k per week, so I find it difficult to believe that money was the motivating factor in his involvement here. Anyway, this whole situation was incredibly shady and sent huge shockwaves throughout the footballing world, particularly in France. Even politicians were getting involved, condemning his actions. It was a mess. And after this news came out, an inevitable statement from the president of the French Football Federation was issued. Sanctioning has never been my cup of tea, but as president of the federation, I cannot remain insensitive to the telephone tapping which appeared in the newspaper in this affair. From today and until a new development, Karim Benzema is no longer selectable for the France team. And this sanction couldn't have come at a worse time. It was mere months before Euro 2016, arguably the biggest international tournament outside of the World Cup, and it was being held on French soil. Benzema was not happy, claiming among other reasons that Deschamps and the French Federation had, quote, bowed to pressure from a racist part of France, hinting that if he weren't of Algerian descent, he might have been treated differently regardless of his circumstance. Didier Deschamps was not happy. All of this led to an indefinite absence from the French national team, during which France won the World Cup as Karim Benzema watched from home. At this point, I'm sure we all get the idea. The man's been subject to mass controversy off the pitch for just about his entire career. As a matter of fact, he's been subject to mass controversy on the pitch also for just about his entire career. To what extent does he deserve to be punished for his past actions? The legal systems have already given their verdict, so anything further is basically up to the court of public opinion at this point, which I'm well aware probably makes a lot of people uncomfortable with how well he's been doing on the pitch. Which brings us back to Real Madrid and takes us forward to 2022. You remember that crazy 2009 transfer window I was talking about earlier? Benzema is the last man standing, with the second last man being Cristiano Ronaldo, who left the club almost four years ago. The longevity of this man is crazy impressive. Being at a club like Real Madrid is one thing, but being a nailed-on starter for about a decade is something special. Oh, and you also remember the 2017-18 season I spoke about, where Benzema was receiving all sorts of criticism for not being as productive as many thought he should have been in front of goal? Literally one year after Ronaldo leaves, Benzema is tasked with being the leading man, and boom. Honestly, what the hell. His rate of production has been absolutely insane since 2018. The guy literally heard all the reporters talking smack and basically said, Seriously, he turned 30 this year, and ever since then, he's only gotten better and better and better, to the point that now, in 2022, at 34 years of age, he is in the best form of his entire career. He's even been reinstated to the French national team as of 2021, and according to French investigative journalist Romain Molina, French President Emmanuel Macron had a hand in making that happen. And this was probably the most tame story that that man broke last year. Seriously, for, for his own safety, I sincerely hope he's taken refuge in an undisclosed location in Antarctica or something. Anyway, Benzema is on fire. 
and it's almost as if everything he touches turns to goals. Heading into the 2022 World Cup, I'm sure he'll be a welcome addition to an already stacked French team. All in all, he's a joy to watch. A sensational player in red-hot form is always a treat, but I can also imagine that there are many that would prefer that that were not the case. He's been accused of some pretty heinous things and even found guilty of others, yet he is celebrated the world over. It doesn't get much more controversial than that. And that's where we're going to leave this one. A lot to consider. I know. But what do you guys think of the man? Do you think he deserves the Ballon d'Or? Do you think he deserves to be on the pitch in the first place? Or do you think that there is much more to this than meets the eye, as is usually the case with these sort of things? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. And that is all from me today. Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you're all staying well. Cheers, and I'll catch you in the next one.